Hello everybody. In the following I want to introduce you an alternative way in how to compute random access on the suffix array when just having the R index, which we call the fine verse forest. This is joint work together with Christina, Hermann and Marcel Miano from the University of Florida. So what we want to do is to create a new data structure on top of the R index that speeds up random access on the suffix array. So why is this important? Because the R index is a refined version of the FM index in that it can take less space than the FM index on repetitive texts, meaning that it needs less suffix array samples. But on the other hand, because you have less samples, you need much more to do to get full access to the suffix array back. So as an example, let's consider three strings, which we want to index and in that we concatenate them with the dollar sign and append a sharp in the end, so that the string becomes this fashion, which we call t. So to index t, the FM index builds the BWT, so you can build here the, the Boris wheel transform called BWT by using the rotations of T which are sorted, lexicographic order, and you read the last column which gives you the BWT. So the FM index builds a wavelet tree upon this BWT such that it gains the, uh, the capability to query for the number of occurrences of a pattern in the text, but to locate where these occurrences are actually in the text, we need the suffix array. And the FM index samples these suffix array positions by the text position. But a refinement is in the R index in that we only need to sample the suffix array entries that start and end with character runs. So here are is a one character run of T and you see on the left hand side the first entry is marked blue and the last one orange. And if it's blue with an orange border this means that it's both the beginning and the end of the run because for instance here you have just a single letter dollar which gives you one run. So if you just store these suffix array samples, how can you get access to the suffix array? And one crucial key is the so-called toehold lemma, which tells you if given you're at position i and in the next position, the subsequent position in both, you have the same letter in the BWT. And if you go from, let's say you're at suffix array position, uh, suffix array entry 9, you go to the entry where it's written 8, so one entry before, and you see the subsequent suffix, and then you can see that the difference of these values of 9 and 17 and 8 and 16 is the same, it's just 8. And this tells you the total lemma. So it's not arbitrary, but whenever you have the same values, subsequent values in the BWT, this key observation holds. Now you can wonder, okay, if that holds, then you can recurse. Like here you have the T's, so it is the same. But now you can again here see that you have just two A's, so they're equal. So you can like, again apply the total lemma for 7 and 15 to find out it's the same difference, it's just 8. Or for 6 and 14, you have again same characters, so it works. It works for 5 and 13 with just t's. And for 4 and 12, but here you have t and a, so they differ. So if you look at 3 and 20, the difference is no longer 8. And you can see that why it works if you think about if you use the standard backward search steps you actually move to the left in the text like here in these two suffixes you move to the left until you find the mismatching character pair t and a which is reflected by the t and the a in the bwt here so 
the rnx just stores these suffix um, this this suffix array entries at the border which we call s and e for sx and ex being the start and the end of the x run where x is a value between 1 and r and r is a number of characters in the character runs in the bwt and what follows for the computation of the suffix array we're interested in answering the following queries on e namely we want to do predecessor and successor queries note that for predecessor we can return the actual element p if p is an e well, for a successor, we require a strictly larger value to be returned, just to make the mathematic formulation easy in the end. And for that, we just build elementary predecessor and successor data structures on E. Now, how to find a suffix array entry? Given that we have one, so let's say we have SAI, but how can we go to the next one, to the subsequent one? This is easy if this entry is actually the end of a run because then the next entry is the start of the next run, which is marked here. So we know already this value because we have sampled it. Otherwise, we take the predecessor of the known value. Let's say this is P. So predecessor means in the text, the previous value is that it's in E. So and if you are smart and we have done some pre-computation, we also know at which position we would have stored it in the suffix array. So we know in the value of SAJ is P. Then we can apply the Toho lemma and it says that these differences are equal. And the nice thing is that we already know SAJ and because SAJ is in E, because P is a predecessor, in E, though we know that the next value just going down, which is here, we have already sampled it. So it's already now, it's the start of, an, of the next run. And we also know SAI, so we can compute SAI plus 1. But actually, this is a computation of phi inverse. So what is phi inverse? You can, for instance, draw an array like here of n integers, so the same number of uh, integers as the length of the text, but we don't want to store that. You only need the definition that fine verse applied to the i's entry of the suffix array gives us the i plus first one. And this is actually what we did for the last entry, because it gives us just the next one, which is the start of the next run. And otherwise we take the predecessor then it p and we got this equation and you can reformulate this equation just by looking at that fine verse applied to sai it gives you like in the definition sai plus one and you do the same for j because you have j plus one here so you can rename it for phi inverse of p because p is saj and you get this shape now you can use that computation like for instance, you have at the second position already the 9 stored, like in this case because you have sampled it. Then you take the predecessor of 9, find it, so this means that you look in, in the lexicographic sorted E for the predecessor of 9, which is 4, so you get 4, and you know that 4 is is here it's the end, so the next value has to be a start of the next run, so you get it just for free by having the samples, which gives you 12. You do this summation, subtracting the p-value, and you get 17. So you know the next suffix array value is 17. If you go down again, so you start at 17, do the predecessor query, you get here 12, uh, 15, you apply Phi inverse, here is 15, the next one is 24, so you get 24, you do the mass and you get 26. So the observation is that whenever you go down, you need a predecessor query. And if you have a long run and you're in this run and you want to have the suffix array entry for that, 
You have to start at the beginning of the run and go all the way down. The number of predecessor queries is bounded by the length of the run, and if these if this run you're in is long, then it could take a long time. So the question is, can you make the, the computation or the iterative process of this fine inverse cause faster? In that, if you have m iterations of fine inverse, can you compute it faster? And, uh, well, we, we did so to think about that. And for the starter is that you again have this special case that you're at the end of a run. So actually you don't have to do anything but just uh, just reformulate it a little bit. So we say that EX is basically predecessor but it's actually the same value. And EY is the predecessor of the next value. Then we can write Fine verse applied to the known value as my, what, what we this is by definition and this is what we have because it's the end of the run and then um, we do su just some su substitutions where cx is the so-called cost of the x run which is the value of the start of the next run minus its predecessor. So it, it's just a substitution, there is nothing done actually here. It's just just um, some pre-computation steps for the next slide. But to give you an idea, you start for instance at the first position, 27, which gives you the end of the run, which is uh, here. And then you know that the next value is sampled, which is the start of the next run, which is 9. You take the predecessor of 9, which is 4, and then you compute the cost, which is 5. And then, because having the cost, you can just compute phi inverse having the 4 predecessor value plus the cost, which is 5, which gives you 9, which is actually the value here. But now, the more interesting case is when you have not a value that is sampled. Like, let's assume that i plus 1 is not in E, then what we do is that we want to recurse on phi inverse. So we apply phi inverse twice, but we have assumed that SII is in E. So we know that this and this holds by the previous slide, and then we know that we are actually here at Sx plus 1. This is in the in text positions, and if we look at the predecessor, which is EY, then we have a distance of CX. This is what CX is all about, the cost of X. Then, because we are here, we can apply the total lemma, because we just looked at the predecessor. And it tells us that for this equation here, we can take the cost out of the application of Feinverse. And we get that Feinverse applied to that is equal to the next run, the start of the next run, which is equal to that if we assume that EZ is again the predecessor of the start of the next run. So we have again another cost of another run. So in total, if we plug that in, in the above equation, we get the equation that it's EZ plus these two costs. But here we did the assumption that the costs did not exceed this ly. So, given that ew is the successor of ey, so the next value, next e value in text position, if the cost would be larger than ly, then the predecessor of sx plus 1 would be ew and not ey. So, we have to look out for that. And as and assure that the costs do not exceed this limit, the limit of the wise run. And if you get the idea, then you probably know that you just now can iterate. So you can do a recursive application of that, and that you first take for a given known value, suffix array value, the predecessor which is in, then in E, and you take initial cost C0, 
between the predecessor and, and the suffix array value. And then you hop around. You do the uh, file inverse application and you visit several runs. And let's assume these runs are x1 up to xm numbered. Then what happens is that you apply this computation and you compute the predecessor of something of the end of a run plus these costs, which gives you a new um, end of a run. And finally, if you apply m times fine verse on your known suffix array value, you get the start of a run of xm plus 1, which is the end of xm plus some costs. I just went very quickly through these equations, so if you don't get everything, the takeaway message is that you just need to sum up these sums, because everything else is basically given. So you have already sampled S and E and you know the costs, so it's just the arithmetic computation. But for each step, whenever you visit a new run, you have to check that the sum, the sum of costs, does not exceed the limit. So actually what we did is kind of a computation on a directed labeled graph. And let's introduce that now. So what we have is a graph which we want to build where the nodes are the values of E. And we connect two values of E by an arc if let's say these values are x and ex and ey, if for ex, the next run, starting at sx plus 1, if its predecessor is ey. This means that if we look at the left tables, set for 27, it's in the next run that starts with 9, its predecessor in e is 4. So we draw an edge from 27 to 4. And we do though for all values of E. And you can see that each node has exactly one outgoing arc. Additionally, we want to label the arcs. And we label them by the costs and the limits. So shown here, again, here the definition of cost and limit. And to get an idea, you just can look at the table and, for instance, if there is a 5, this means that the difference between the next starting, start, starting point of, of the run, 9, my, minus its predecessor, 4, is 5. Or for 3, it's 7 minus 4. Or for 1, it's 24 minus 3. For the limits, you just have to look at the E value in the same run, in the same row. For instance, for 22, the next value, the successor value of 22 is here 23, so you write 1. For 15, the next value is 18, so you write 3. And this gives you the shape of this graph. Now, what can you do with this graph? You can do the same computation. So you can compute suffix array i plus 1 if you have suffix array i. But you can speed up now the process, and what I want to show now. So you start with a given value. Let's say you're again at the first position, which is 27, and you take its predecessor. In this case, we have already sampled 27 because it's shown here, so it's, it's already in the graph. So you get zero costs. You get larger costs if it's not there, because then you take the difference between what you have minus the predecessor. But now the predecessor is the same value, so it's zero. What you do is you traverse the graph. So you have always one outgoing arc, and you take this arc, and query for the limit, whether the limit exceeds your accumulated costs. Your costs are zero, uh, but the limit is one, so it's, it's larger, so you can traverse this arc and go to four. 
And here, what you do now is that you accumulate the cost of the arc to your cost, so you get a cost of 5. And because you're now here, you can already report the next suffix array value for 2, which is 9, because the label of this node is 4, plus a cost 5. And what you now do is that you repeat that until you find an arc where you no longer can traverse it. Here for 4 and 12, you have already a cost of 5, but the arc allows you a cost of 6, so the, the limit is 6 and you can traverse it. You're below it, so you can traverse it and report for the next suffix array entry, which is at position 3. That is 17, because the node level is 12 plus a cost 5. You try again, but this time the limit of this arc is 3, which is less than your cost of 5, so you have to stop. But that tells you actually that you have to run again a predecessor query. So remember we reported 17, but the predecessor of 17 is not 12. If you look in the graph, we have 15, and 15 is more closer to 17. So we have to rerun the predecessor query for our actually currently hold suffix array value. And this gives us 15 and the cost to the difference between those two values. So we jump to 15 and compare again the next arc with our costs. We have a cost of 2 and the limit is 3 so we can traverse it and report for the next suffix array entry. 26, because the node level is 23, plus 3 gives us 26. So, what we actually did is that we omitted the predecessor computation at the time whenever we traverse an arc. Because when we just took the arc, we could immediately report the next suffix array entry. But whenever we could not traverse an arc, this means that we needed a new predecessor. And for that, we needed to call a new, uh, the, call the predecessor data structure. But it can happen that you have actually a very long pass where you don't have to call the predecessor data structure at all. So if you have super good costs, very low costs and very high limits, it could happen that you can move around very long. And with that, we thought about cutting that out to cut, create shortcuts. So what we did is that we built on long paths so-called fineverse trees. So for instance, if we take this, this orange path out and write it down here again. Then what we did is that we first interpret each outgoing arc, the level of each outgoing arc, as a node level. So this 5.1 becomes the node level 5.1. Next we pad this, this, this pass with dummy nodes such that the number of nodes becomes a power of two because what we want to do is to create a perfect binary tree and we pad it with zero minus one and minus one is a negative limit which we never can uh, which we never can traverse so it's it's untraversable so next it follows the perfect binary tree and for that, we obey the property that for the internal nodes, which also store costs and limits, that its costs, the cost of an internal node, is the sum of the cost of its children, and its limit is the minimum of the limit of the left child, and the limit of the right child minus the cost of the left child. This actually means that we simulate that we have already taken the left child and because of that we have to 
reduce that potential limit by this cost. If we have that tree, what can it be helpful? Well, we can traverse it to find more quickly the node where we first reach this limit bound. And for that, we start at a leaf where we currently are. Then we climb up the tree until we hit this limit, limit, <laughs> the limit of the limit, and then we descend down to the leaf where we first exceed the limit. To understand that, there is another example where we start at 27 with a cost of zero. So we will go up, but here you can see you cannot proceed because the limit is negative. So you take now the cost of the left child, which is 5, and you try on the right pass when descending whether you can traverse, but all the limits are below 5, so you have no other chance to take the leftmost leaf, which leads us to 12, and 12 plus 5 gives us 17. So we actually jumped over one suffix array entry. And so we can just hop around and don't need to compute all suffix array entries successively if you want to have random access at a certain value, but are more free to jump. And for larger values, this, this is just a jump of two, but for larger data sets, it could be a much longer jump. And Actually, we did some preliminary experiments on chromosome 19 datasets. So from the 1000 uh, genome project, we took chromosome 19 subsequences and ran the suffix array benchmark, so taking random entries of the suffix array with the standard solution with the R-index and compared that with our solution. There are other solutions already available, like this R index and so on, but they kind of work similarly. Fortunately, currently we're not kind of experiencing this boost up which we hoped to achieve, so it looks like it's, it's kind of the same in, in terms of the time, but of course we have a memory overhead which it's not so large, so remember this is already 2, two gigabyte. So um, because you need to store the phi inverse trees and the phi inverse graph, which gives you the phi inverse forest. So what we have is the phi inverse forest, which is an order R space data structure on top of the R index. It provides you with random access to the suffix array, where the query time depends on the length of the run and the values of the costs and the limits. And as open problems, well, we have just only trivial time bounds. For instance, for the tree traversal, for the fine inverse tree, you need order of log r time because in the worst case, the number of leaves is bounded by r. And otherwise, you can need a predecessor query for the traversal the phi inverse graph, which takes this kind of time. And there is currently no theoretical analysis of the number of expected calls of the predecessor data structure. So any help is very welcome. Nevertheless, thank you for listening and also any questions are welcome.